Hi, my name is Jennifer Kuyak. I am a musculoskeletal radiologist who works at Virtual Radiology. And today I am going to talk to you about sports related injuries in children and adults, as well as some normal variants. This module is accredited for 0.25 AMA Category 1 credits. And today we're going to have three learning objectives, including describe the findings of Van Neck Oldenburg disease, name the three types of femoroacetabular impingement, and name the two imaging signs of a core muscle injury, otherwise known as a sports hernia. So let's get to case number one. This is a patient who came in with buttock and hip pain. And as you can see on this baseline study, there is normal bilateral ischio pubic synchondrosis in this 12 year old. This is six months later, and as you can see here, there's asymmetrical fusion of the right ischiopubic synchondrosis with this expansile lytic appearing lesion in the left ischiopubic synchondrosis. This patient underwent CT imaging, which revealed an expansile lytic lesion with sclerotic border and punctate calcifications and asymmetrical closure of the right ischiopubic synchondrosis. On MRI, on this T1 weighted sequence, you can see asymmetrical closure of the right ischiopubic synchondrosis and expansion and hypointense signal in the left ischiopubic synchondrosis. On this STIR image, you can see there is edema and hyperintense signal surrounding the left ischiopubic synchondrosis and closure of the right ischiopubic synchondrosis. The diagnosis is Van Neck Oldenburg disease or asymmetrical expansion of the ischiopubic synchondrosis. Van Neck Oldenburg disease is usually left sided due to unevenly applied mechanical stress during athletic activities causing prolonged persistence in the non dominant, usually left limb. It's commonly seen with soccer or other kicking related sports, and it's due to stress from the adductor muscle group on the fixed leg. The patients usually present between the ages of 7 and 15 years due to the timing of the closure of the ischiopubic synchondrosis, and some patients may be asymptomatic. So the differential diagnosis includes a stress fracture, osteomyelitis, unchondroma, fibrous dysplasia, or even an osteosarcoma. However, clinical history and laboratory findings is critical, and if you perform follow-up radiographs after rest, what you'll see is closure and improvement of the affected issue of pubic synchondrosis. And here is a reference article for you to read through at your leisure if you prefer. The second case is a patient who presents with medial knee pain. And as you can see here on the radiograph, there is a lucent lesion within the medial supracondylar cortex with a deep sclerotic rim. And again, on this oblique radiograph, you see a lucent lesion in the medial supracondylar cortex with a deep sclerotic rim. On CT, you will see a lucent lesion with a deep sclerotic rim. On T1 weighted MR imaging, this lesion is nearly isointense to cartilage and muscle as shown on this sagittal T1 weighted image. On PD and T2 weighted imaging, the lesion will be hyperintense as demonstrated on this sagittal PD weighted image. Again, the lesion is hyperintense as shown on this axial T2 weighted fat saturated image. The diagnosis in this case is a cortical desmoid, which again is a lucent lesion within the medial supracondylar cortex with a deep sclerotic rim on radiographs and CT imaging, and is nearly isointense to cartilage and muscle on T1-weighted MR imaging and hyperintense on T2-weighted MR imaging. A cortical desmoid is most prevalent in boys 10 to 15 years of age and is a tug-related injury at the adductor magnus aponeurosis or medial head of the gastrocnemius muscle. This may be related to an acute or chronic injury and can be asymptomatic. The differential diagnosis includes a non-ossifying fibroma or a normal femoral line, which I will show you in the next slide. 
And as I promised, as you can see on the left on this sagittal PD fat saturated image, a non ossifying fibroma, which is superior to where you would expect a cortical desmoid. And on the right, you see a normal femoral line, which is thin, hyper intense signal deep to the cortex. And here's a reference article for you to peruse at your leisure. So the third case, we're going to talk about a patient who came in with right-sided hip pain. And as you can see here, there's contrast extending into an enlarged and somewhat globular appearing anterior labrum. And on the sagittal T1 fat saturated image, you can see there is contrast extending into the anterior superior labrum. And on this chronal small field of view, T1 fat saturated image, you see contrast extending deep to the labrum at the chondrolabral junction, indicating labral detachment. And on this chronal small field of view image, you see a cortical bump within the anterior lateral femoral head, otherwise known as a pistol grip deformity, which you can see on radiographs as well. And if you measure an alpha angle, you'll see that it's elevated at 61 degrees. So this is cam type femoroacetabular impingement with a labral tear and detachment. There are three different types of femoroacetabular impingement. You have the cam type, which involves the femoral head neck junction, as you can see on the top right. Pincer type, which is acetabular overhanging. And then you can also have a mixed type, which is very common. This is diagnosed by physical exam and anatomy. They present with hip pain, restrictive motion with a positive impingement test. There's all these different measurements that you can do, alpha angle, femoral head neck offset, center edge angle and the crossover sign. And this also predisposes the patient to premature osteoarthritis. This can be treated conservatively or with surgery. And here is an article that you can review at your leisure. So this fourth case I want to show you as it is a normal variant and I do not want you to misdiagnose this as this patient was. This is a smoothly marginated indentation in the acetabular roof at the 12 o'clock position lined with cartilage. And you can see this patient has the anomaly bilaterally. Here on a small field of view PD weighted sequence, you can see again the smoothly marginated indentation in the acetabular roof at the 12 o'clock position lined with cartilage. And on the satchel image, it confirms the 12 o'clock position. So the diagnosis in this case is a normal anatomic variant, which can mimic pathological etiologies. This is called a supraacetabular fossa, or otherwise known as a pseudo defect of the acetabular cartilage. And again, it's smoothly marginated in the acetabular roof at the 12 o'clock position lined with cartilage. If you look at a lot of hip MRIs, you'll see quite a few of these. And again, it's in 10% of the hips, normal anatomic variant. And you should see it at the 12 o'clock position in both the coronal and sagittal planes. You'll have normal surrounding marrow. And there's two types, one that fills with contrast, one that's filled with cartilage. But just know it's at the 12 o'clock position and it's a normal anatomic variant. And here is an article for you to review at your leisure. So case number five. Case number five, we are going to talk about a patient who came in with groin pain. This is a football player who was having persistent, somewhat debilitating groin pain. And as you can see here on this small field of view, chronal stir image, you see a superior cleft line, which is hyperintense signal along the inferior margin of the superior pubic ramus pointed out by this arrow. And again, here is an axial small field of view stir image showing a curvilinear hyperintensity along the inferior margin of the superior pubic ramus. And a sagittal image, you can also see this hyperintense curvilinear signal along the inferior margin of the superior pubic ramus. A second sign that you can see in this case is called a secondary cleft sign, and this is a curvilinear hyperintensity along the inferior margin of the inferior pubic ramus 
as you can see here on this small field of view chronal stir image. Here is an axial small field of view axial image and again you see the secondary cleft sign which is a curvilinear hyperintensity along the inferior margin of the inferior pubic ramus. And as you can see here on this diagram, you see the superior cleft and the secondary cleft sign. And again, this is one of the teaching points of today's case. You can see parasymphyseal bone marrow edema. So this is a core muscle injury, otherwise known as a sports hernia. This is a misnomer. So the term we use now is core muscle injury. Core muscle injury, otherwise known as a sports hernia, is seen in 5 to 23% of all sports related injuries that result in groin pain. It's most commonly seen in males and most commonly seen with sports such as football, soccer, ice hockey, and rugby. The symptoms that the patients present with are tenderness palpation that's worsened with hip adduction. This can be treated with steroid injections, PRP injections, as well as surgery in some extreme cases. And here are some reference articles for you to review if you like. This last case is a 45 year old female who presents with right sided sternocovicular joint pain. And as you can see here, there is sclerosis along the inferior margin of the clavicular head on this radiograph. And as you can see here on this inverted radiograph, you'll see sclerosis within the inferior margin of the right clavicular head. On this axial CT image, you see sclerosis along the inferior margin of the right clavicular head with notable preservation of the sternoclavicular joint. This is a chronal image again showing the sclerosis along the inferior and medial margin of the clavicular head with preservation of the sternoclavicular joint. A whole body bone scan was performed in this case to exclude metastatic disease, which revealed increased uptake within the medial right clavicular head with no additional areas of uptake. Here is a different patient demonstrating sclerosis within the medial left clavicular head with preservation of the sternoclavicular joint. This patient also underwent whole body bone imaging demonstrating increased uptake within the medial left clavicular head. On MR imaging, the area of sclerosis will be hypointense on the T1 weighted imaging with preservation of the sternoclavicular joint. Here it is on STIR and you'll see intense marrow edema surrounding the area of sclerosis. The diagnosis in this case is condensing osteitis of the clavicle. Condensing osteitis of the clavicle is a rare benign process often misdiagnosed. It's almost exclusively reported in females in the fourth to fifth decade due to asymmetrical stress on the sternoclavicular joint from carrying an asymmetrical load on either arm, such as a kid, groceries, purses. The differential diagnosis includes a bone island, osteoid osteoma, which you would see a joint effusion, chronic osteomyelitis, which again, you should see it on both sides of the joint with a joint effusion or metastasis. Treatment is usually an intraticular steroid injection, rest, NSAIDs, or in extreme cases, surgical resection. Here is a reference article for you to review at your leisure. So today we talked about six different cases, including Van Neck Oldenburg disease, which is usually left-sided and is seen in young soccer players with asymmetrical expansion of the ischiopubic synchondrosis. We talked about cortical desmoids, which patients can present with medial knee pain and is a benign tug related injury and not a tumor. We talked about femoral acetabular impingement where there are three types, including cam type, pincer type, and mixed type. This predisposes the patient to early osteoarthritic changes and labral tears as well as labral detachment. We talked about supraacetabular fossa, which is a normal anatomic variant of the acetabulum at the 12 o'clock position. We talked about core muscle injury, otherwise known as a sports related injury with two signs, including the superior and secondary cleft signs. And we talked about condensing osteitis of the clavicle, which is a benign stress related injury along the medial and inferior margin of the clavicular head. I hope you uh, learned something today and I hope you have a great day. Thank you.